a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court chapter twenty seven the yankee and the king travel incognito about bedtime i took the king to my private quarters to cut his hair and help him get the hang of the lowly raiment he was to wear the high classes wore their hair banged across the forehead but hanging to the shoulders the rest of the way around whereas the lowest ranks of commoners were banged fore and aft both the slaves were bangless and allowed their hair free growth so i inverted a bowl over his head and cut away all the locks that hung below it i also trimmed his whiskers and mustache until they were only about a half inch long i tried to do it inartistically and succeeded it was a villainous disfigurement when he got his lubberly sandals on and his long robe of coarse brown linen cloth which hung straight from his neck to his ankle bones he was no longer the comeliest man in his kingdom but one of the unhandsomest and most commonplace and unattractive we were dressed and barbered alike and could pass for small farmers or farm bailiffs or shepherds or carters yes or for village artisans if we chose our costume being in effect universal among the poor because of its strength and cheapness i don't mean that it was really cheap to be a very poor person but i do mean that it was the cheapest material there was for male attire manufactured material you understand we slipped away an hour before dawn and by broad sun-up had made eight or ten miles and were in the midst of a sparsely settled country i had a pretty heavy knapsack it was laden with provisions provisions for the king to taper down on till he could take to the coarse fare of the country without damage i found a comfortable seat for the king by the roadside and then gave him a morsel or two to stay his stomach with then i said i would find some water for him and strolled away part of my project was to get out of sight and sit down and rest a little myself it had always been my custom to stand when in his presence even at the council board except upon those rare occasions when the sitting was a very long one extending over hours then i had a trifling little backless thing which was like a reversed culvert and was as comfortable as the toothache i didn't want to break him in suddenly but do it by degrees we should have to sit together now when in company or people would notice but it would not be good politics for me to be playing equality with him when there was no necessity of it i found the water some three hundred yards away and had been resting about twenty minutes when i heard voices that is all right i thought peasants going to work nobody else likely to be stirring this early but the next moment these comers jingled into sight around a turn of the road smartly clad people of quality with luggage mules and servants in their train i was off like a shot through the bushes by the shortest cut for a while it did seem that these people would pass the king before i could get to him but desperation gives you wings you know and i canted my body forward inflated my breast and held my breath and flew i arrived and in plenty good enough time too pardon my king but it's no time for ceremony jump jump to your feet some quality are coming is that a marvel let them come but my liege you must not be seen sitting rise and stand in humble posture while they pass you are a peasant you know true i had forgot it so lost was i in planning of a huge war with gaul he was up by this time but a farm could have got up quicker if there was any kind of a boom in real estate and right so a thought came randoming overthwart this majestic dream the which a humbler attitude my lord the king than quick duck your head more still more droop it he did his honest best but lord it was no great things he looked as humble as the leaning tower of pisa it is the most you could say of it indeed it was such a thundering poor success that it raised wondering scowls all along the line and a gorgeous flunky at the tail end of it raised his whip but i jumped in time and was under it when it fell and under cover of the volley of coarse laughter which followed i spoke up sharply and warned the king to take no notice he mastered himself for the moment but it was a sore tax he wanted to eat up the procession i said it would end our adventures at the very start and we being without weapons could do nothing with that armed gang if we are going to succeed in our emprise we must not only look the peasant but act the peasant it is wisdom none can gainsay it let us go on sir boss i will take note and learn and do the best i may he kept his word 
He did the best he could, but I've seen better. If you have ever seen an active, heedless, enterprising child going diligently out of one mischief and into another all day long, and an anxious mother at his heels all the while, and just saving it by a hair from drowning itself or breaking its neck with each new experiment, you've seen the king and me. If I could have foreseen what the king was going to be like, I should have said, No, if anybody wants to make his living exhibiting a king as a peasant, let him take the layout. I can do better with a menagerie and last longer. And yet, during the first three days, I never allowed him to enter a hut or other dwelling. If he could pass muster anywhere during his early novitiate, it would be in small inns and on the road. So to these places we confined ourselves. Yes, he certainly did the best he could, but what of that? He didn't improve a bit that I could see. He was always frightening me, always breaking out with fresh astonishers in new and unexpected places. Toward evening on the second day, what does he do but blandly fetch out a dirk from inside his robe? Great guns, my liege! Where did you get that? From a smuggler at the inn, yester eve. What in the world possessed you to buy it? We have escaped divers dangers by wit, thy wit, but I have bethought me that it were but prudence if I bore a weapon too. Thine might fail thee in some pinch. But uh, people of our condition are not allowed to carry arms. What would a lord say? Yes, or any other person of whatever condition, if he caught an upstart peasant with a dagger on his person. It was a lucky thing for us that nobody came along just then. I persuaded him to throw the dirk away and it was as easy as persuading a child to give up some bright, fresh, new way of killing itself. We walked along, silent and thinking. Finally the king said, "'When ye know that I meditate a thing inconvenient, or that hath a peril in it, why do you not warn me to cease from that project?' It was a startling question, and a puzzler. I didn't quite know how to take hold of it, or what to say, and so, of course, I ended up by saying the natural thing. "'But, sire, how can I know what your thoughts are? The king stopped dead in his tracks and stared at me. I believed thou wert greater than Merlin, and truly in magic thou art, but prophecy is greater than magic. Merlin is a prophet. I saw I had made a blunder. I must get back my lost ground. After a deep reflection and careful planning, I said, Sire, I have been misunderstood. I will explain. There are two kinds of prophecy. One is the gift to foretell things that are but a little way off, the other is the gift to foretell things that are whole ages and centuries away. Which is the mightier gift, do you think? Oh, the last, most surely. True. Does Merlin possess it? Partly, yes. He foretold mysteries about my birth and future kingship that were twenty years away. Has he ever gone beyond that? Oh, he would not claim more, I think. It is probably his limit. All prophets have their limit. The limit of some of the great prophets has been a hundred years. These are few, I ween. There have been two still greater ones, whose limit was four hundred and six hundred years, and one whose limit compassed even seven hundred and twenty. Gramercy! It is marvellous! But what are these in comparison with me? They are nothing. What? Canst thou truly look beyond even so vast a stretch of time as seven hundred years? My liege, as clear as the vision of an eagle, does my prophetic eye penetrate and lay bare the future of this world for nearly thirteen centuries and a half. My land, you should have seen the king's eye spread slowly open and lift the earth's entire atmosphere as much as an inch. That settled prayer, Merlin. One never had any occasion to prove his facts with these people. All he had to do was to state them. It never occurred to anybody to doubt the statement. Now then, I continued, I could work both kinds of prophecy, the long and the short, if I chose to take the trouble to keep in practice, but I seldom exercise any but the long kind, because the other is beneath my dignity. It is properer to Merlin's sort, stump-tail prophets, as we call them in the profession. Of course, I wet up now and then, and flirt out a minor prophecy, but not often, uh, hardly ever, in fact. You will remember that there was great talk when you reached the Valley of Holiness, 
about my having prophesied your coming and the very hour of your arrival two or three days beforehand indeed yes i i mind it now well i could have done it as much as forty times easier and piled on a thousand times more detail into the bargain if it had been five hundred years away instead of two or three days how amazing that it should be so yes a genuine expert can always foretell a thing that is five hundred years away easier than he can a thing that's only five hundred seconds off and yet in reason it should clearly be the other way it should be five hundred times as easy to foretell the last as the first for indeed it is so close by that one uninspired might almost see it in truth the law of prophecy doth contradict the likelihoods most strangely making the difficult the easy and the easy difficult it was a wise head a peasant's cap was no safe disguise for it you could know it for a king's under a diving belt if you could hear it work its intellect i had a new trade now and plenty of business in it the king was as hungry to find out everything that was going to happen during the next thirteen centuries as if he were expecting to live in them from that time out i prophesied myself bald-headed trying to supply the demand i have done some indiscreet things in my day but this thing of playing myself for a profit was the worst still it had its ameliorations a prophet doesn't have to have any brains they are good to have of course for the ordinary exigencies of life but they are no use in professional work it is the restfulest vocation there is when the spirit of prophecy comes upon you you merely cake your intellect and lay it off in a cool place for a rest and unship your jaw and leave it alone it will work itself the result is prophecy every day a knight-errant or so came along and the sight of them fired the king's martial spirit every time he would have forgotten himself sure and said something to them in a style a suspicious shade or so above his ostensible degree and so i always got him well out of the road in time then he would stand and look with all his eyes and a proud light would flash from them and his nostrils would inflate like a war-horse's and i knew he was longing for a brush with them but about noon of the third day i had stopped in the road to take a precaution which had been suggested by the whip-stroke that had fallen to my share two days before a caution which i had afterward decided to leave untaken i was so loath to institute it but now i had just had a fresher reminder while striding heedlessly along with jaw spread and intellect at rest for i was prophesying i stubbed my toe and fell sprawling i was so pale i couldn't think for a moment then i got softly and carefully up and unstrapped my knapsack i had that dynamite bomb in it done up in wool in a box it was a good thing to have along the time would come when i could do a valuable miracle with it maybe but it was a nervous thing to have about me and i didn't like to ask the king to carry it yet i must either throw it away or think up some safe way to get along with its society i got it out and slipped it into my scrip and just then here came a couple of knights the king stood stately as a statue gazing toward them had forgotten himself again of course and before i could get a word of warning out it was time for him to skip and well that he did it too he supposed they would turn aside turn aside to avoid trampling peasant dirt underfoot when had he ever turned aside himself or ever had the chance to do it if a peasant saw him or any other noble knight in time to judiciously save him the trouble the knight paid no attention to the king at all it was his place to look out himself and if he hadn't skipped he would have been placidly written down and laughed at besides the king was in a flaming fury and launched out his challenge and epithets with a most royal vigor the knights were some little distance by now they halted greatly surprised and turned in their saddles and looked back as if wondering if it might be worth while to bother with such scum as we then they wheeled and started for us not a moment must be lost i started for them i passed them at a rattling gate and as i went by i flung out a hair-lifting soul-scorching thirteen-jointed insult which made the king's effort poor and cheap by comparison i got it out of the nineteenth century where they know how they had such headway that they were nearly to the king before they could check up then frantic with rage they stood up their horses on their hind hoofs and whirled them around and the next moment here they came breast to breast 
I was seventy yards off then, and scrambling up a great boulder at the roadside. When they were within thirty yards of me, they let their long lances droop to a level, depressed their mailed heads, and so, with their horsehair plumes streaming straight out behind, most gallant to see, this lightning express came tearing for me. When they were within fifteen yards, I sent that bomb with a sure aim, and it struck the ground just under the horses' noses. Yes, it was a neat thing, very neat and pretty to see. It resembled a steamboat explosion on the Mississippi, and during the next fifteen minutes we stood under a steady drizzle of microscopic fragments of knights and hardware and horseflesh. I say we, for the king joined the audience, of course, as soon as he had got his breath again. There was a hole there which would afford steady work for all the people in that region for some years to come. In trying to explain it, I mean. As for filling it up, that service would be comparatively prompt, and would fall to the lot of a select few, peasants of that seigneury, and they wouldn't get anything for it either. But I explained it to the king myself. I said it was done with a dynamite bomb. This information did him no damage, because it left him as intelligent as he was before. However, it was a noble miracle in his eyes, and was another settler for Merlin. I thought it well enough to explain that this was a miracle of so rare a sort that it couldn't be done except when the atmospheric conditions were just right. Otherwise he would be encoring it every time we had a good subject, and that would be inconvenient, because I hadn't any more bombs along. End of chapter 27